Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to your Wednesday night webinar brought to you by NoCD, NoCD, an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive and related disorders with treatments available in the US and Canada and the UK and Australia. We take most insurances as well too here in the US. So feel free to reach out for us if you're looking for a therapist, specifically to work in the teletherapy world with you for any of those conditions like you know, hoarding and BFRBs and ticks and all that fun stuff in addition to OCD as well too. Tonight, I have the pleasure of having two wonderful people join me. One who I might have had a hand in his whole reason he does what he does, just, just slightly, I don't know, uh, Michael, maybe. Yeah, actually, Michael, you know, Michael, it was very funny. I was going through a bunch of stuff at the house here. I, I'm kind of on a purge right now. And and I found your thank you card after some consultations <laughs> that we had done. Oh, I was wow. like, how appropriate is that since he's going to be on the show this week? That's right. Wonderful. right? Yeah. And, and yeah. thankfully, it's not three million degrees in this virtual room as it was in the uh, BTPI oh. consultation room. So that, good. that's good. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, I think we were all stripped down near naked in there. It was so it was so darn hot, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which then caused a lot of anxiety for everyone and, mm -hmm. and yeah. scarred, scarred for life life uh, as, as well. Too. Yes, uh, So, Josh, Michael, I'm going to hand it over to the two of you to introduce yourselves, what you do, where you're from. And then we have a book to talk about, I believe, as well after that. So, Josh, let's start with you. Cool. Uh, welcome. Good evening. I'm Dr. Josh Spitanek. I'm the practice owner of Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta in, you guessed it, Atlanta, Georgia. We have over 20 OCD and anxiety specialists. We're an outpatient center serving all ages, kids, teens, and adults, treating like no CD, the OCD and anxiety spectrum and the BFRBs and the ticks and the trauma and all the sort of associated conditions. Um, and several of us can see people in over 40 states around the country, which is amazing. And we have clinicians in several states. And my dear colleague, Michael Steer, is one of them. So we are uh, thrilled to be here, Patrick, and um, can't wait to answer some questions. Awesome. Michael. Uh, and my name is Michael Steer. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Illinois. Uh, and so uh, Josh and I had found each other and I was able to graciously join his team and now get to be able to call them home, not physically, but virtually. So um, I'm a virtual therapist. Um, I'm licensed in a couple different states, Illinois, Missouri, and then Georgia. Uh, but St. Louis is where I call home. So um, there's only a little bit of beef between Patrick and I in terms of like the Chicago area and the St. Louis area, you know, those types yeah. of things. So Well, I, um, and I lived in the St. Louis area, so I like both. Yeah, you did. Although, you did. Yeah. The, the yeah. pizza down there does not does not do well. I gotta, yeah. yeah. Okay. One thing. Yeah. All right. But, like, the Cubs, <laughs> the anyway, um, oh, I agree with the Cubs. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. No, I'm a yeah. Sox fan. I, you know, if I had to pick a team, it's the White Sox. So <laughs> I, I despise the Cubs as much as you do, Michael. So, okay, yeah. good. Yeah. We're yeah. on the same page then. So, yeah. Yeah. uh, and, and, uh, so, you know, I, uh, owned my own private practice for a while and really, and then before I was able to join anxiety specialist of Atlanta, um, and, uh, treating OCD, um, a lot of different themes around intrusive thoughts. And more recently, really been getting into uh, health anxiety and finding the combination of how psychological condition can also be with medical condition and all the confusion. Uh, and so I'm really happy to be here. And and I have an a STO love. That's right, Melissa. I, I'm glad to see that. So, um, But I'm glad to be here, be able to answer some questions and be able to partake in some uh, questions and answers with these two fine gentlemen. And then the piece de resistance, shall we say. Uh, I believe a book's been published recently, and let's let's chat a little bit about that. There have been a lot of books published over the years. <laughs> <laughs> None of which have been by us. No. no but no. Uh, mm -hmm. several years ago, Michael and I, Michael, as he said, connected um, uh, me, and he and I have a passion for treating OCD, but also those co-occurring medical kind of issues and uh, talked about doing some health anxiety work and have collaborated on a few projects. And then he and I decided to foolishly do something, Patrick, I think you've done once or twice, which is to put the pen to paper and put your thoughts organized and put it out there. And mm -hmm. uh, Michael and I mm -hmm. put together a, a book and you know there were some opportunities to maybe go with a publisher and we decided to go our own route for a bunch of reasons that we'll maybe talk a little bit about tonight. But um, the book is all about health anxiety. It's actually 
the complete guide to Ooh overcoming health anxiety. Look at that. Look at that. With a little bit of a subtitle yeah, yeah. that we love. How to live life to the fullest because you're not dead you're yet. Not dead I yet. love it. Yes. That's With right. two awesome authors, but a forward, guys, a forward out there that I think will never be rivaled. Uh, and I hope everyone reads. Who, oh my gosh! By, did I did I read by the you know? infamous yeah. Dr. Patrick <laughs> McGrath? I must have. He and I go back about 15 years back to like substance abuse and addictions and anxiety and yeah. virtual reality technology. So Michael and I have had the the joy and pleasure of having a professional relationship with Patrick over the years, and he was gracious enough to write truly a very thoughtful, personal, impactful, um, almost a memoir. And a few pages that we call it was a forward. little long. Yeah, sorry, about that. a little long. It was, it was, it was intense, and it, and it was a great it was a great start to a book that Michael and I are proud of. That is a very skills based book. It's a it's yes. a for people who have lived experience with health anxiety. It's also yes. for clinicians, but it was definitely written for the person who is struggling with health anxiety or loved ones supporting someone with health anxiety. And this is health anxiety whether you have real physical symptoms or you wonder if you have physical symptoms or you've battled past medical issues. Um, and the book is chapter by chapter, sort of a step by step approach to understanding what it means to live with anxiety and to face anxiety, to have the mindset of being an anxiety specialist. Um, it's all about the skills at the end of each chapter, which are very broken down, concrete and tangible and ready to use. And uh, the reason that Michael and I went rogue <laughs> and uh, went a little bit of a different direction is we've also used a lot of humor, metaphors, movie narratives, song quotes. Goofy statistics, scary statistics, things that most publishers would probably shy away from, Patrick. So mm -hmm. we went off the grid and wrote a book that we would want to read. Mm -hmm. And we hope that everyone out there who gets a chance to, to read it benefits from it, but also enjoys it. That's our hope. Where, where might our guests watching tonight be able to find said book, by the way? Amazon. All Keep right. It simple. Uh, it simple. There's a paperback version. There's a uh, e-version on Amazon. Um, and we also have a corresponding website that Michael and I have been working on that's out there, uh, overcominghealthanxiety.com, keeping it very basic. That's overcominghealthanxiety.com, free website, free resources, some downloads from our book, FAQs, uh, information out there, podcasts, webinars. We've tried to compile sort of the best of best of everything we think that is evidence-based and aligned with the kind of interventions that no CD supports and trains the kind of interventions that Michael Nye and our team at Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta supports, trains, and implements. And so we're trying to bring all those resources into one location, Patrick, uh, to make it easily accessible for people to access, download, and then ask us questions and have a little bit of a community of people who are health anxiety warriors. And if that happens, then the book has uh, been a fun project, but to bring people to together and give them a platform to be heard and understood, um, it's everything. And you know that. I mean, you're overseeing yeah. thousands of clinicians providing those level of services. So Michael and I, in that website, you can click through and find free support groups that we offer um, and other treatment sort of resources we have for health anxiety. And um, you know, we appreciate you being here, um, having us on here to offer as much available low cost resources as, as possible. We're, we're in the same business. Yes, we are. We, uh, we, we always say we don't compete with each other because there's plenty to yeah. go around. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and just one uh, thing oh yeah, go ahead, Mike. I was just gonna say one thing I just wanted to add to all the things that Josh had mentioned is, you know, with the website and with the book, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to try to create was, you know, therapy is such a relationship based type of experience. And, uh, and you can read a lot of wonderful workbooks, and I have many of them. Um, but one of the things that we were really hoping to be able to do was when you get done reading our book, I hope it feels like you're walking out of a session with one of us. Uh, now you also get the maybe sometimes bad jokes that come with that too, but that's just part of the process. So you're just going to have to, you know, kind of put up with it, but you might laugh and chuckle at some points too. So we hope that not only this is a book and this is why it might just be a little bit different is that it's going to be a book like Josh had mentioned, that's going to give you skills and tools, but we also hope there's a relational aspect to it too, that it makes it feel like you're in a session with one of us, um, which I think has a profound impact on the change process in, in itself of being feeling like you're not just reading a book, but you're with one of us. So I just want to edit that. And, uh, and, and the website, I can't remember if you mentioned it, Josh, but you, you can put in your own scary statistic. So if you yes. wanted to join the fun or, you know, we're always trying to add to it. So if you see something in the fact or the, uh, the health anxiety one on one section that you feel like we've missed something, or there's something that you, you should add, you can always email us, uh, on there. 
and tell us something that maybe we could add to it. And we would love to add your suggestion as well. So fantastic. All right. Um, I'm going to put that website, right? I mean, there's a, how do you keep up with all these questions? This is overwhelming. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So if you guys see a question that you like, since we have guests tonight, uh, I, I always love you to be able to jump around, especially because we'll have a theme tonight of health anxiety. So if you want to grab some things, please feel free. I'm, I'm going to jump on a, a very basic one, which I love that Star asked, is it also OCD? And uh, where, where I think almost... The, just give me the time and then I'll pop it. Oh, up sorry. 147 PM, which um, okay. I guess very that's good. a minute 47 into this. So love that question because why are we talking about health anxiety? on a no CD uh, platform. And I think um, though academically, everyone in the professional field would call health anxiety, which is actually health anxiety is not even a diagnosis. The diagnoses are, are called illness, anxiety disorder and somatic symptom disorder. So without getting too much in the academics, the space of health anxiety has its own academic space in the ways in which we understand disorders. But everyone at no CD, anxiety specialist of Atlanta and all the colleagues that we love and support around the world, view health anxiety either as a sub theme of OCD mm -hmm. or as its own category that eerily mimics the symptoms of OCD, mm -hmm. meaning that there are triggers, things that get people really upset about their health concerns, whether it's past, present, or future, that there are these reactions to it that we call fears or obsessions. And then we react to those fears and obsessions in a way to make them go away, which we call compulsions or rituals, safety behaviors or avoidance. So um, the question is OC and health anxiety kind of one and the same is a great question. And if you read the book, if you go online, if you find resources, if you go on other podcasts, you'll see that people talk about it the same way. The way we assess it, the way we diagnose it, um, the way we treat it are, are eerily similar. But there are some real special nuances, Patrick, Star, and others, about what we want to find out about and how we negotiate with our clients and patients about how to start the treatment process. And I think one of the beginning starting points of what makes it so specially different is first of all, I hope if you're a health anxiety therapist, that you know a little bit about the medical field, not overstepping your boundary, but that you know enough to know that you don't know too much and that you should be consulting with medical providers. So for anyone that we see that has concerns about their health status, Patrick, um, we're making sure that they've had as close to a clean bill of health or a checkup or a workup for the concerns that they have. So we're not starting therapy treatment prematurely. That's right. a that's a real unique twist to what OCD typically you wouldn't do. And we want to make sure that we're not doing anything, you know, before we start getting the treatment. But OC and health anxiety are kind of one and the same. And mm -hmm. I view health anxiety as sort of a sub theme. It's a hyper focus and worry about things that fortunately for people that we treat are not pressing. They're not medical. They're not life and death right now. But like all the themes in OCD, they feel right feel. now and they feel life and death. Well, and Star's comment before that one. Uh, talks to about uh, thoughts give me feelings and the feelings are so real. And and I think I mentioned that almost every webinar that I do where, where someone at some point will say to me, but why does it feel so real? And my comment is always the same, which is, well, it has to, or else it wouldn't be a problem because if it didn't feel real, you'd go, oh, I have that feeling, uh, uh, whatever, because it doesn't feel real. So it has to feel real. And that's why you could get a wonderfully clean bill of health from a doctor and still feel like there's something wrong because that is not a logical feeling. That is an emotional feeling, actually. And we know that emotions are primal over logic. Uh, you know, when, when a cheetah is chasing you, doing complex math is not the thing to be doing, right? <laughs> it, is, it is to be getting the hell out of there. And so, yes, things are always going to feel real. And that's one of the tricks, I think, of anxiety and probably health anxiety too. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, that our, our brain is convinced that because this feels real, it is real. And I'd, I'd love to hear your comments on that. When I think what's also important with what you're just saying, Patrick, sorry, my lights were turning off for a second. It's bedtime apparently, but it's back on, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you know, Rock one of the things Michael. that it... <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I think what's important with that too, is a lot of the concerns that we have, uh, that, you know, that we maybe see with clients is, you know, maybe the focus is on, maybe I'm having a stroke or maybe I'm having a heart attack or what if I have ALS, right? And when we think about this aspect of, 
uh, of, you know, it feels so real. There's also this aspect that sometimes I like to pull out with clients, which is, have you ever had one of these experiences before? Have you ever had ALS before? And, and there's so often like, well, no, I've never had that before. But there's then this interpretation of this feeling of like, but I'm sure that if I was having this, this is what it would feel like. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, well, but if we've never had a heart attack before, how do we know that that symptom is actually a symptom of a heart attack, right? So mm -hmm. there, is, there are kind of a lot of assumptions that can happen when we say, I would imagine that if I was having this experience, this is what it would feel like. Yes. However, you know, it becomes this tricky kind of combination that we also know that whenever we're having a heart attack, most likely I haven't had one, thankfully. Um, and also when we feel incredibly anxious, they can, I think what makes it so confusing is they share so many different symptoms. It would be yeah. nice if these medical conditions and anxiety would just have separate categories. It'd be but great. It'd be much yeah. easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We would even have to write a book then, which would yeah. be, you know, which would be fine. Because no one, would... no one got the memo on that one. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the other the other thing to think about for us when we have these physical symptoms is even if they're misinterpreted, Patrick and Michael, even if we're catastrophizing them, my response is your brain's working. Thank God you're feeling some physical symptoms. Thank God, you know, in OC, we talk about sort of sexual responses or groinals or heart palpitations. Thank God your brain is working between here and down there, or here, or right here, because if it wasn't, I'd actually be more concerned. It is functional to have physical responses. It is, it is important to have those physiological and physical responses. The dilemmas, dilemmas between that moment and the interpretation you make, that little, that little uh, gap of time is where all the decisions get made for someone where these worries sort of slide off, or I call it like Teflon. And for people who have OCD or other kind of anxiety conditions like health anxiety, we make meaning out of it. We come up with a story and we start believing that story. And then we start acting in response to that story, which is sensible, Patrick, because, you know, if your heart's racing, jump out of the way of the cougar, except mm -hmm. there's no truck that's about to run you over, but it feels like it's going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. I want to honor that with, with health anxiety specifically. And um, at, at 526, be here, be now mentioned that they have somatic OCD, eerily similar. I mean, they're, they're kind of almost the same category where be here, be now is focusing on physical things that he or she doesn't have to focus on. You don't have to think about smiling. You don't have to think about your breathing, how you swallow, the way your tongue feels, whether you're going to blink again. And those are terrifying things to think about because now you're thinking about a function that your brain's going to do no matter what. And health anxiety is not, not terribly different, which is you're now fixated on physical symptoms that your brain is supposed to be emitting. You're supposed to be feeling discomfort. You're supposed to have a little lump in your throat, have a little sore elbow. You're supposed to have a sore elbow, but that doesn't mean you need your arm cut off or that you need surgery or that it's bone marrow cancer. So, so your brain is doing what it's supposed to be doing at a biological level, which I think is fascinating. But then when the reptilian brain goes away and our brains kick in, Patrick, yeah. I, I'm just doing an it. exposure to a weird smile to see okay. what, okay. what happens. So you're going the for three it. Of you're going all can, in. We could all do a weird smile and wonder if we'll be canned tomorrow by our professional colleagues, or they may all think, that was a great exposure that they did right there with the really Michael, weird there's, there's a Patrick. There, is, he having a is he having a stroke? Is he having a stroke? Is there? It kind of. It there looks a, like it. Oh, give me is just kicking in. It, it kind of sounds like it as well, too. I, I think, think we need to clean bill health to start. Yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, that's what it is. Or, or I'm doing my best, Carl Spagler from uh, Caddyshack. You know, uh, do, 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 do. but. So now, be here, be now, what do you think of me that I just had the weirdest facial expression that I could do at that point in time? And I'm wondering if now Michael and Josh will say, after this webinar, we're never talking to that fool ever again. Did you see? We said that face? actually, we said that before the <laughs> webinar. Yeah, we, already decided we, that. we thought it was a different host. That we were expecting yeah. Howie Mandel tonight and we got Patrick. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. You know, next best thing. Yeah. So, uh -huh. <laughs> but you know, I I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here. You guys pretty much knew exactly what I was doing right away when I started doing that. And 98% assumed. Yes, there you go. 98% there. And we'll take that, right? Because we're yeah. never going to have it perfectly. But um, so be here, be now, now that I've done the most awkward smile possible, uh, what, what will be the negative effect on me because of it? Or, Maybe there was one in my head, but the reality is that that isn't there. And even if it was there, 
could I handle it far better than I've ever given myself credit for the ability to be able to handle it? You know, I, I think you would both agree. Our goal in doing ERP isn't to prove to people that everything's going to go well, because not always nope. does it. Our goal in doing any ERP is going to be that we can handle whatever happens. <laughs> you may get, from a health anxiety point of view, you may go get a test and you may find out news you don't like. It is possible. I like uh, at 702, it seemed like there was another good question. It says health anxiety was a good rule, quote unquote rule, uh, mm -hmm. as far as symptoms and testing for an illness go. So uh, not testing every time I feel the slightest symptom. And that looks like it's from Nerva at 702. You're, you're so, saying 702. I don't see a 702. Patrick and I aren't seeing Oh, you know why? Uh, I am seeing it because you are in a different time zone than we are, Josh. So therefore, <laughs> nice. you are seeing it. I'm always in a different time zone. Yeah. Uh, is it this one, Mike? Is that nope. Two up. Right. From Two up. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Lots of 702s were coming in there. Okay. There yeah. we go. I guess we'll mm -hmm. just put up with the Eastern time zone person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, it's Eastern yeah. people. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, right. But I, I, I point this one out because I, I like how we put the, uh, the quotations around rule, which is, mm -hmm. yeah. I wish there was a rule. Um, and it actually would make our job a lot easier if there was some set standard of, hey, as long as you go to the doctor twice, um, you're good. You know, as long as they don't find things two times, you're fine. And I think this is where it becomes sticky. And also there's some difficulty about so we start to ask the question, how much is enough to go to the doctor or to get a clean bill of health? And I think that becomes very difficult just because there is no rule there. You know, some people would feel more comfortable going once, twice. Uh, it also kind of depends. And in, in I know in, in um, an important piece to bring up to this, too, is also trust in your healthcare providers. That can make a big difference. And everybody, just to be clear, it's a difference for me between trusting a healthcare provider and also maybe then experiencing doubt or uncertainty with a healthcare provider. And it's important to feel that trust, but is there a certain rule that we can go for? Probably not. One of the things that I think is always important to kind of look at with that is when, did, when does it start to become not functional for our lives? You know, how many times do we get that answer before that answer starts to interfere with our lives more than it adds or takes away things. Are we avoiding things or are we spending, you know, hours and hours in the ER where we yeah. could be doing other things with our family yeah. and, uh, you know, surprised that if you come in and you're like, wow, my nose kind of hurts a little bit, you're probably going to be pushed to the back of the line, yeah. unfortunately. And so, you know, I think there's that, that's a good question, but it's also a very challenging question because as there, there is just no certain answer in those cases, but I think a good way to start to look at that is even though I keep going back, if I keep getting the same answer over and over again, and I'm noticing how much these things are interfering in my life, maybe that's where I take a risk, but it's also not just a risk without benefit because by taking that risk, by not going to the doctor again, not going to the ER urgent care, we also get to engage in other things in our life whether that's with family, kids, hobbies, activities, you name it, it does allow us the opportunity to maybe, maybe to engage in those. Patrick, you talked about that in your forward as you watched your wife battle her, her seriously scary illness that led to her demise. I mean, you talked about mm -hmm. when is she going to give up the searching and, and everyone has their own rule in that. And yours yeah. was different than hers and hers was different than yours. But uh, in the aftermath, you've you know, shared with us in the world your thoughts on how much searching she did. Yeah, um, I, it, it's a vulnerable thing to discuss, but I, I love doing it because I believe in a good genuineness of it. And I was I was ready with Susan for her to stop treatment much earlier than she did and just try to enjoy the time that we had remaining. And she wasn't ready for that. She wanted to do more treatment. And I am a absolute firm believer that all of that extra treatment that she did actually worked against her in instead of was helpful to her and that was the hardest piece uh, for the last year until she went on to hospice was i kept trying to say to her you know hey every time you take a new treatment look at what happens you get more tired you drop more things the neuropathy gets worse your walking gets more unsteady you do all of these things let's just pause here and try to just 
kind of enjoy what we have instead of going for this next thing, which is probably based on the history going to give us similar to results to what all the other things have done too. And, you know, she had an amazing constitution in the sense that she wanted to live and she wanted to figure out a way to get through it. So I couldn't fault her for it whatsoever, but I also watched it from the background knowing I, I can see where this is going as well too. And, and that really and to, to, mm -hmm. to pivot that for what Michael and I really want to talk about to as many people as we can we're not here to take liberty with people's lives, my, uh, uh, Patrick. It's not a joke no. to us. We're not trying to no. get people sick and get them killed. And we're sure as heck not trying to tell people to compromise their medical care. Or, you know, if they want to go for their third, fourth, and fifth medical opinion, by all means, go for it. The majority of the people that we treat over time are going to find out, as you've described just there with Susan's battle, that when you're not battling a di identified medical issue, you are literally killing yourself. Hmm. And we, we in jest, you know, the subtitle of the book is, how to live life to the fullest because you're not dead yet. And the dilemma with health anxiety, again, starting with this assumption that you're not currently batting what I would describe as either a immediate life altering illness, forget chronic illness, because a lot of people that we treat have chronic illnesses with mm -hmm. health anxiety, but that you're, you know, your life is not on a line in the next six months to, to, to a year, that the things that you're doing to get answers, the, the online searching that you're doing, the time you're spending mm -hmm. avoiding doctors or seeking out doctors, checking your symptoms, dodging people, fabricating symptoms, fabricating appointments, second guessing yourself, second guessing the medical institutions, it's killing you. And mm -hmm. it's not a joke. I've, you know, I've lost family members to cancer. I talk about my losing my father to cancer. But when you don't have cancer and you're searching out what cancer you have. Yeah. I'm you're sorry, living as if you have cancer. That's the cancer. Yeah. And there yeah. are people that have cancer yeah. that are living a better quality of life Yes. As they're fighting like hell to figure out how to get better, but also how to spend those last moments, weeks, months, or years with their loved ones, mm -hmm. they have a better quality of life than the person who doesn't have the medical issue that we mm -hmm. know of in that moment. Maybe they do and the doctors haven't found it. But to all of our knowledge, when we're treating this, they don't have that illness, but they're acting like they do. And you know, you with your with your wife, my father, and who's lost someone close to them. I mean, I can't snap a finger and take away my dad's cancer. He's gone. But Without overstating this, with OCD and health anxiety, those rituals, that seeking, that extra question, that wonderment, I saw in the, in the, the notes here about mental compulsions from Mecco, Bob, me at 7.35, my time. All that time spent up here, you could snap a finger. And if we can teach you the skills with ERP and ACT and other wonderful cognitive behavioral interventions and drop those rituals, your anxiety might not go away. But you're searching to figure out when you're dying does. Mm -hmm. And if that goes away, you've opened up your entire world for anything other than killing yourself slowly by trying to find out something that you might or might not have. And that mm -hmm. that's the biggest challenge that we have in treatment, Patrick, which is to help someone yeah. drop those rituals. I mean, that's it's epidemic in OCD. It's what we all are brought together on. But in health anxiety, you're chasing something that currently either you don't know you have or the doctors have actually ruled out. And people with that condition are living a better quality of life. And it's heartbreaking to see that. So to get someone beyond that moment, to give up all those actions, mental or behavioral, it's life-changing. It's affirming. They get to find the thing that they're looking for. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Michael and I know when we write in the book, 33 plus or minus percent of us are going to get cancer. We may not die from cancer, but over a third of the patients, Patrick, that you and me and Michael are going to see, will get a diagnosis of cancer at some point in their life. Well, we'll have cancer at some point in their life. And that's just a fact. Yeah. But until you get that, what kind of life do you want? And that's right. what we're here to champion. And, and that was my quote in the foreword that I say all the time, didn't just write it for the book, which is you're going to spend yeah. the rest of your life living next to your tombstone, wondering when you're going to be six feet under, or are you going to spend the rest of your life living and having a hell of a time arriving on the day of your death at your tombstone going, well, that was a blast. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that that's all I want for people to do is that I want people to have that experience. I lived with somebody who didn't have that experience and, and I saw just how tough that was. And so I'm on a mission to make sure that people live their life, even if they have a condition, that they still live their life and not be stuck worrying about when it's not going to be there anymore. Tyler Sneed, 757. 757. Uh, writing at Chloe. I'm literally dealing with the same thing. So Chloe, Tyler Sneed, all of you. We feel you, Michael and I, Patrick, and every mental health professional. I saw some names here. You know, some shout outs to some other professionals that are in here. We feel you. 
The thought of dying terrifies all of us. Nobody wants to die. No one wants to leave, you know, anything on the, on the playing field. You want to put it all out there and make the most of your life. And um, I love that Patrick, you, your organization, colleagues, the work that we do, all the wonderful OC and anxiety specialists around the country are fighting every day to help people live a life that's worth living and not live a life chasing death. Mm -hmm. So to all of you, Tyler and Chloe, I hope you have either proper support and care, our book, the website we have, the support groups that NoCD offers that we offer. Those are the right venues to find out you're not alone. There are other ways to deal with this. The anxiety is brutal, but not living a full life to me is the real death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stupid OCD. <laughs> Stupid health sucks, anxiety. man. <laughs> Spam emails a real, I can't say the bad word on here. Can we say bad words on here? Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Spam emails a bitch, man. Yeah. Horrible. Horrible. Not good. <laughs> Not good. Any others that you guys have looked at you wanted to jump into or, or check out? Uh, one person I'll point out to you just because uh, Beth has become one of our champions lately. And we have Lavana yeah. who's on here all the time too. But Beth uh, spent years even after COVID, not leaving her home. And in the last couple of months, with the encouragement of everybody on the feed in this webinar, has left her house, gone shopping, has and is living her life. And recently even described last week where paramedics came to her home because her brother was sick and she didn't wear a mask around them and nothing happened to her and everything. So there's another Great example. Amazing. That's a wonderful example of health anxiety and, and the fears around COVID and things. And I wonder if you guys might want to spend a moment talking a little bit about COVID and, and uh, like a global pandemic and health anxiety and, and its its impact on people in the world. I was going to say this might tether well to, it looks like on 729, uh, Catalina had asked a question that I think goes a, a, with your, what you're saying, Patrick, is what are some of the reasons that health anxiety spurs up in someone's life when that person has never before experienced health anxiety? A person who was previously fearless and now always fears being ill. And so I think there's, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I think we've, we've probably seen in practice is that COVID was an interesting time, what's to say. Um, and also for one of the things that I think Josh and I have talked about is kind of the rise of health concerns after this experience mm -hmm. um, because in many ways uh there were a lot of different um rituals we could say that we need to be very mindful about there was a lot of fear especially in the very first part of the pandemic um, about what would happen and how does this virus operate and all of these different things that were very scary um and there was a lot of things in terms of cleaning and wiping things down and i think it became quickly a perfect storm for a lot of health concerns, um, especially when we pair it with being able to possibly spread it. And you can asymptomatically spread it to other people, which is just wonderful ground for feelings of responsibility and you know making sure that we're taking care of other people. I think there's a lot of variables in that. Now, I think when we think about the bigger picture, I think COVID has an impact on that. Um, I know somebody, I think somebody in the chat, and also there was a question we had earlier today when people talked about having a previous medical condition. Mm -hmm. If you've yeah. had cancer before, I have quite a few people that have um, have been diagnosed with cancer, they've been treated for cancer, all their scans come out great, clean, and there's still that persistent worry and concern mm -hmm. of what if they're missing something? What if mm -hmm. something could come back? Mm -hmm. And so I think there can be a lot of different triggers um, to those. And I think just whether it is previous health concerns if it has been, you know, COVID itself sometimes is a uh, is kind of a ripe ground, not only just because of the stress in itself, but also just because of all of our concerns around contamination and making sure that we stay uh, safe. I think a lot of things can lead to just getting caught into that trap. Hey, the other problem with COVID is it's reminding us of all the symptoms everyone else has. I mean, the, the, the misinformation we had at the very beginning, which is laughable at this point, not thousands of hundreds of thousands of people who died, but watching medical doctors wash vegetables on their island and then move them over to the other side of the island. And that was a way to sort of, I mean, so even us in the medical and mental health field were wrong on the front end of what we were supposed to do to manage and prevent COVID. And that would upset anybody, whether you have health anxiety or not. So to know that we had misinformation, misinformation on the front end, and Michael, to your point that, you know, the, the all the symptoms that go along with COVID, 
I, th I think would make anyone sort of more hyper aware, hyper vigilant to their breathing, to sniffling and sneezing. I think most people who don't have a, a, a genetic vulnerability or a predisposition to health anxiety or OCD, Patrick, flew on airplanes and didn't give a poo poo about people <laughs> coughing, sniffling and sneezing. And I don't battle OCD or health anxiety, but when I'm on a plane and someone's coughing near me, of course I'm wondering, oh man, <laughs> am I gonna get COVID? Am I gonna get the next thing? And mm -hmm. so in the last three to four years, all of us have become more in tune to people's respiratory, because COVID is mostly respiratory, respiratory ailments from little ones to old ones. And, you know, when someone's like, hey, you're coming to, your, coming to my party and I don't feel that well, the, our, our first response is, please don't come to the party. No one said that five to seven years ago. No one yeah, cared right. about that. Mm -hmm. So so we're all a little bit more in tune to and concerned about getting whatever someone has now. And COVID messed all that up for us. Um, I know early on in the first round of COVID, the first year or so, most of the OCD therapists in our community were wondering, like, how do you treat contamination OCD and health OCD, knowing that right now it's contextually relevant? I think most of us said, don't diagnose it. Don't, don't overthink it. If someone's concerned about a health ailment right now, they should be concerned about it because people are dying. We're in a different phase now, thank goodness. And we know a little bit more. But more importantly, most of us are still very mindful whether you have a history of anxiety or not, of people sniffling and sneezing and coughing and boogers and all that gross stuff. And that's unfortunate. That's an unfortunate side effect of what COVID has done. Um, and unrelated to health anxiety, uh, NoCD probably knows this. And that's why the NoCD clinic and, and groups like you guys are so critical. The amount of people coming in for mental health services has skyrocketed mm -hmm. um, from the teens and up, little ones as well. People who historically would not come to treatment are coming to treatment for all sorts of psychiatric issues. And people who historically were in treatment are staying in treatment longer. So health anxiety aside, for people who battle debilitating anxiety, OCD, and depression, the rates of mental health needs have skyrocketed during and post-COVID for a bunch of reasons that we still don't fully understand. But as OCD and health anxiety specialists, um, it's frustrating when people are asking, you know, should I hand sanitize? Should I bring masks with me? Masks with me? What, I don't want to go on this trip because I don't want to get what someone else has. And how do you say don't worry about it. That's not a response. So right. again, this comes back to everyone being accountable for their own health, their own health care, and being as vigilant as you can to take care of yourself, understanding that there are risks with getting on an airplane, mass transit, yeah. um, and being, being at conferences like we go to every year. I have no qualms about wearing a mask on a crowded train or an airplane or something yeah. like that. You know, part of the reason is I want to go and enjoy the conference and not get something. Exactly. So I will take precautionary measures at time too. And if that's However, the concession you have to make, mask versus not going, wear the yeah, mask. I'm going to wear the mask. But yeah. I don't do that because I think, oh, my gosh, if I don't do this awful, horrible, you know, it's not driven by an obsession. It's driven just by I had a quick thought. I decided, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. Here's the reason why. Cool. Move on. Uh, it, hours and hours were not spent pondering and wondering and all those kinds of things. And that's no different but, than someone having, uh, let's say, a new onset of a symptom. Yeah. I'd be freaked out by that. You know, you know, I'm, annoyed. I'm almost 50. I've been for any, any new symptoms that you and I have, Patrick, Michael, not fun to have at our age. Of course yeah. I go to my doctor. And if the doctor gives me a clean bill of health, I'll think about it. Maybe I'll go for a second opinion. And after that, for me, it slides off like Teflon, but for some people it doesn't stop there. And we're aware of that. And it's when that starts building and building and you start engaging in rituals and compulsions and going deeper into a, the recess of fear. And that's when things get real scary. Second part of this question, I just wanted to address real quick because it kind of came to my. It says mm -hmm. a person who previously fearless and now always being fears being ill. When we first started the uh, the stream, we were talking about the differences between health anxiety, OCD, and some of the commonalities between them as well. And I think one thing to kind of also remember is that I'm sure that many people on the stream have had a OCD concern or uh, a certain obsession that at one point ruled their lives and then at another point was like i can't believe i worried about that mm -hmm. what was i mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. um and so it's also important to kind of consider is you know it could have been something that you know whether it was COVID or another medical condition that may have led to some of these things the other thing i would just put in the back of your head is is this another theme of ocd that's just trying to scare you uh and if it is we really like to come back to what we just term as a functional assessment which is uh, not necessarily the monster itself, but what the monster's trying to do. And is this just a new OCD monster that's trying to scare you? And if you can call it out for its antics and being like, hey, wait a second, I know what you're up to, um, we might realize that maybe one of the reasons why that has changed or shifted 
is because maybe before that was never really on your mind. And that's your new thing that uh, that health anxiety and OCD has latched onto. This happens also sometimes even just with medical conditions itself. I've had clients that maybe the biggest concern was a heart attack, whatever you might, whatever you'd say. I actually had somebody um, message me this previous week and just ask the question, hey, is it, um, is it normal that sometimes it just likes to move around to different parts of the body and choose different things to be concerned about? And I said, no, I think there's something's really, really wrong with you. No, I actually didn't say that. Uh, not yet. Um, but not yet. I said, not yet. Not yet. Uh, actually, I did, I did address that by saying, yes, that's relatively normal, or you're very unlucky and you've developed many medical conditions at the exact same time. Yeah. I think we can just probably Amazing. avoid one of those. So, yeah. um, but I think it's that. important when people think about this question, there can be something that has happened, but the other thing to just always think about is if you have other themes of OCD that at one time have ruled your life and then other times have not, I think it's important to kind of think of as like, is this what health is doing to me now? You know, before maybe I really didn't even focus on it, but now it's been everything in my life. Sometimes that's just a shift in an OCD theme and it's just important to call it out for what it is. Mm -hmm. Well said. I like this question too. Your text doesn't include psychosis under health anxiety umbrella. Can you say more about why it was excluded? <laughs> well, so I, I don't know if I'm fully understanding the question, but some other people have asked about focus on mental health concerns. Yeah. And I've had the pleasure of doing some presentations with Patrick. I'm not sure what I did with you and I did with John Hirschfield and a few others. And we talk mm -hmm. about mental health. This is a weird phrase. Exactly. Mental yeah. health health anxiety. It's yes, a yes. space in between there. Uh, that's where they're going, confusing. I believe. So that's yeah. why I just, yeah. I know you've done a lot on that. So I figured it's a- Oh nice yeah. So the short it. answer is, as Michael beautifully said, OCD doesn't care what yeah. the day of the week it is or what body part it is. It's going to attack it. And so in the medical space, for us, medical is medical and medical. So whether it's bumps and bruises and leukemia and ALS, gout, diabetes, or stroke, or it's medical of the amygdala and limbic region, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, um, any other sort of debilitate, debilitating psychiatric issue, psychosis. You could almost call the suicide-themed OCD areas, Patrick and Michael, sort of in this space, which is the fear of doing something out of your control or losing control. But the short answer is, is to Michael's point, it's going to find your vulnerable area. And if you're afraid of losing your mind, afraid of being incompetent, afraid of going crazy, afraid you carry some label or diagnosis, OCD slash health anxiety is absolutely going to go for the jugular and attack it and make you wonder, did you just hear something? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry, I was in the middle. Are y'all hearing that? <laughs> oh, no. oh, yeah. What? Right. Who? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Do I have schizophrenia? What, what, what's yeah. going on here? So you it might. doesn't care whether it's a medical condition like most of us think about medical or what I would describe as a medical psychiatric condition because all of us – I mean, I feel substance abuse is a, is a medical psychiatric condition. I view mm -hmm. the depression as a medical psychiatric condition. So any mental health condition that we use in the DSM or the ICD, or whatever way you diagnose people, those are all fair game for health anxiety. And so that's just called mental health, health anxiety. We talk about that a little bit in the book. The next book that comes out, Michael, it could be about mental health, health anxiety, but it's pretty common in the OCD community. People that are afraid that they have some psychiatric issue that they think they have that they probably don't have. But when you spend time wondering if you have that condition and you live in mm -hmm. fear of wondering if you're losing your mind and you sit there trying to contemplate if I'm losing my mind and you ask yourself if you're losing your mind, Patrick. I might be. It is. Possible. It might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what condition it is, guys, medical or psychiatric health anxiety will go after it. Now here's a fun related one. Can y'all talk about emetophobia as well? Right. I mean, I will say this from all my years at Alexian Brothers, this was the number one specific phobia that I treated, the fear of throwing up. So, In our clinic as well. I know Michael's mm -hmm. virtual, but we probably treat fear of vomit, number one, probably fear of needles, because we see a lot of kids here as well, number two. And then I guess you, social anxiety used to be called social phobia. So I, yeah. if, I, if I knew social anxiety, yeah, metaphobia is probably the number one thing. And fear of driving, even though it's a really hard one to treat. Um, Michael, you want to? Talk all about emetophobia. Sure, sure. People yeah. In the stomach. Yeah. And, and you know, I think what's important with this is and why there's such an overlap. While, while we would call emetophobia, emetophobia, then also health anxiety a little bit separate, yeah. there are a lot of shared combinations with this, especially mm -hmm. this 
I think, and, and if anybody ex experiences a metaphobia here, the preoccupation with how I feel, you know, uh, and especially with a metaphobia, a lot of times it's going to be focused around the stomach, you know, throat, all those different kind of sensations. Yeah. If, if, you know, am I sick to my stomach? There also can be this interesting kind of combination of like, well, in health anxiety, there can be a lot of things like, um, uh, oh, I got to make sure I check all the expiration dates um, because I don't want to get sick, you know, and something maybe really could bad could happen to me. I could get sick, you know, who knows, crazy things can happen if I eat food that's, you know, maybe expired or maybe close to expired or just kind of like kind of smells funky or maybe it's bad. I'll just throw it out. Um, but we also think of is like, well, that could be a shared experience with a metaphobia as well, which is just. I don't want to get sick. I don't, I don't want to throw up. So I think the one thing that I see, at least in a lot of the times where I seem, and, and lately I've seen a lot of more emetophobia clients is that there are a lot of those shared experiences between I get a sensation, whatever that sensation is. And what does that mean? Uh, now that is a pretty dangerous game playing the game, the, the game of what does that sensation mean? Um, because a lot of times that's when our brain comes to the conclusions of all these terrible things. And it's like, I'm dizzy, I'm going to throw up. And it's like, I, I'm sure there's other times you could be dizzy too, that you don't throw up. Um, but a lot of times those conclusions can take us away. But I think, and I don't know, maybe you can add some other reflections that you see in, in, in your clients, Josh, but I think the one thing that I see that's so common amongst those two things is the hyperfixation on those physical symptoms. One thing that I always try to like work with people with too that, that that I think can be helpful is there can definitely be subjective experiences with sensations and objective experiences with sensations. So if we were going to say like, well, my stomach kind of feels tight, that's a pretty objective description of a sensation. Um, but if you're going to notice a stomach sensation and then we were going to get into all this narrative about this means I'm going to throw up and it's going to be everywhere and all these different things. Uh, you may be right, but that's also not here or there. The thing that is here is my stomach feels tight at that point. And so I think that's one of the areas that we can try to come back to is, can I just describe this experience for what it is? Maybe not what it could be or what it could lead to. Any other thoughts from you, Josh, and your experiences with well, these? What, what I just, just add to that is emetophobia is one of those real interesting, tricky ones because it's one of the few phobias, OCD or health anxiety spaces where this concept of disgust shows up. So we're not here to talk about misophonia, which is a real strong reaction to certain sounds and sensory things. But in misophonia, um, ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, so a big response to not eating food, and emetophobia and some other subconditions, disgust, D-I-S-G-U-S-T, becomes a real thing that you have to address. So besides all the things, Michael, you shared about, like the bodily reactions, and for some people, the fear of losing control, 80 to 90% of us are nauseated by throw up. No one wants to see or experience throw up. Most of us don't spend our time worrying about it or thinking about it. But when you're treating emetophobia, for some people, you have to address that disgust reaction because it is disgusting to be around. And for those who are disgusted by it, it's not something you're going to will away or sort of habituate from because most of us are highly responsive to the sounds of nails on the chalkboard or a baby crying or the smells and sights of vomit. But we use those smells and sights to actually help someone overcome being in control in the in the face of that kind of stuff. So disgust reactions is an interesting space in emetophobia. Another interesting piece of emetophobia work, Patrick, is we don't talk about it, but like the by proxy. A lot of, especially a lot of kids mm -hmm. are afraid if that person throws yeah. up, then what if I throw up? Mm -hmm. If that person's going to puke, especially like in the car with two kids, I, I won't get into too many details and out my kids, but one of my kids <laughs> absolutely hates this. And when my other kid goes, Ooh, one yeah. covers their ears, I'm trying, trying to use gender not, and bolts <laughs> out of the kitchen or out of the car. And so like, you know, it's one of those conditions when you see someone else have it, you freak out that either could get on you or that could happen to you, right. which we would, you know, in clinical works, we call it by, by proxy. So it's a weird condition. It's a very treatable condition. It is a phobic reaction and there's some elements to it, but um, yeah, it, it can cause all sorts of health sensitivity things, Michael, as you really nicely pointed out, because we're being hyper in tune to swallowing and gagging and sour foods and spoiled foods and expired foods and my tummy hurting and tummy aches. And if you think about your tummy long enough, you're going to make a tummy ache. I mean, that's just how it works. So, um, yep. but the treatments are pretty traditional exposure therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and, and 
There it is right there. The pink There's elephant. My, the pink elephant lives on my desk right there. Yep. So, yeah. And we have, Patrick, we have jars of vomit, some mostly fake, but <laughs> jars of yeah. vomit looking vomit. Oh, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all those kind of things in our clinic for all people. We have kids make unicorn vomit, which is kind of fun. Oh, the like vomit with, with sprinkles and sparkles and strings. Yeah. And so they make unicorn vomit and dump it in the toilet to make the sound. So at least have some fun and play with it using sort of play approaches with exposure therapy to help people start approaching really challenging topics. It's, it's, it's actually very empowering and a lot of fun. One of the things, Michael, that you said, and a lot of people in the, in the uh, thread are, are resonating with it. And, and as we're getting closer to the end here, I think this is a good way to look at wrapping up. You said, the preoccupation, the preoccupation with how I feel has resonated with a lot of people. And I wonder if maybe we could spend a few minutes really talking about that. We talked earlier about if it feels real, but, but let's talk more about that preoccupation with how I feel, because I'll say this just to start off. No one's ever come into a session with me and said, I'm really worried that I feel great. Right. So, so we could add to the preoccupation with how I feel negatively because no one's really concerned about feeling good right so i'd i'd be interested in your to take especially now with the experience of writing this book and all the research and things that you did and and i'll tell you i had fun reading the book before writing the forward to it and everything it just learned a lot myself about it so what did you guys learn about the preoccupation and the time spent wondering about how we feel i think the one thing that i would uh, add to that. Hold on, real quick. <laughs> oh, he's dying. Yeah. Throat, he's dying. Broke yeah. cancer, guys. I'm Code sure it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's fine. Quit it's probably just because yeah. it was like 70 degrees in St. Louis, and then it's like 30, and then it's maybe 70. And <laughs> oh, then there's it's the rationalization. On Monday. Yeah, 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 it's fine. Yeah, it's good. It's, good. Yeah. it's probably just the weather. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Broke cancer. Throat. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> so, uh, um, Lung emphysema. Think, yeah. Black COPD. lung. Yeah. Okay. I can't good. tell if these are real. <laughs> get, I, schizophrenia. I, 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 uh, uh, well, and and so, and so this preoccupation with how we feel, I I think is one of the things that can get us stuck the most. Yeah, and it's understandable, right? Because if we have something that's going on with us, of course we want to tune into it, right? Like Josh had kind of mentioned earlier, that's adaptive. If we notice something's wrong with us, then yeah, we need to take care of it. We need to do something about it. The hard thing about that is that the preoccupation of how we feel also becomes the way that we can just never move on. Right. Because the hard thing is this starts to become the catch-22, right? Because if we notice some part of our body that just feels something, whatever it might be, and it could just mean nothing, it could mean something we don't know, um, we're going to tune into it more. But the problem is, just kind of like when you're talking about the pig elephant, we're going to notice it more. Uh, I thought about this whenever my kids got lice, which I was kind of upset about. I went through school all this time and I never got lice, uh, but my kids brought it home. And as soon as that happened, yeah, that's what started to occur, right? Be like, yes. uh, <laughs> is it itchy? Is it not itchy? Oh, no. Um, but the hard part about that is that's the preoccupation. We tune into our bodies more which is the more that we find. And when we find more, we tune in more because it's concerning, it's anxiety provoking. And the difficult part about this is that if we can never create some type of break from this preoccupation, we don't even have a chance to move on. We don't even have an, uh, you know, there's no way that we can be able to move on if we continue to come back into the cycle. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think can be helpful that, that a lot of times we start to look at is we start to kind of look at how can we train our attention to be able to place our focus on the things that are most helpful? Um, and this is not a distraction because a distraction to me is an escape, but a redirection is a focus on our values or something that's just going on at that period of time or something more helpful. Paint drying is more helpful than considering just thinking about my scalp more, right? But if we're able to create some type of redirection, which is, hey, I'm noticing that I'm getting focused on my stomach, how it feels, or my heart, or my chest, or this kind of interesting pain that I have in my shoulder, or whatever it may be, we do have, to, you know, it is hard work because now we have to, in some ways, kind of take a risk. Uh, do I need to follow this, or do I need to direct my attention in some other way? Now, if we're going to choose the risk, 
maybe I can just say, I don't know what this is. I felt this before. I've gotten this checked out. Who knows? But I'm going to focus on dinner or I'm going to mm -hmm. focus on this movie or I'm going to focus on uh, having, you know, uh, going out with friends or work or you name it. Um, it is a risk, but it, at least it gives us a chance to be able to exit the loop. Because if we don't take that risk, we just get sucked right back into it at that point. So I think the one thing that I think is important when we think about that is even though this risk sometimes can feel very scary, like we've come back to, it also gives us a chance that at some points we can allow ourselves to move on from that, um, where previously maybe we get sucked back into it. Mm -hmm. Josh, Michael, you just pulled in, well, you just pulled in two or three of our chapters, which really talks about yeah. the cognitive side of stepping. You mentioned this earlier, and I, I wanted to compliment you and kind of like highlight it because it's a real skill. You talk about worry monsters, the cognitive side of CBT and whether you're doing mindfulness-based CBT or ERP or ACT or whatever CBT intervention you come from, ICBT or other ones, the cognitive side of this is to be able to step back from that running inner dialogue that is anxiety-driven. And if you can step back from that and choose almost anything cognitively and behaviorally other than the worry monster focus, and we say values because in general, it's going to be more rewarding, Patrick, and more fulfilling and more purposeful if you feel good afterwards. So mm -hmm. we're talking about going towards goodness, going towards positive. The ability to step back from your anxiety and really objectively, like, you know, Shakespearean, like a lost poor York, the skull is in your hand and really objectively look at it and divert your attention to something that matters. That is the master skill that everyone at NoCD and Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta and every anxiety clinic you're going to talk about and go to that we really love and support is trying to teach the ability to have enough insight to know that this is OCD or health anxiety gnawing at you, that when that moment happens, you have the cognitive ability to recognize it's happening. It's not me. I'm not those thoughts. I can have my own thoughts. I'm going to have my own thoughts. And I'm going to now focus and or do something that really adds to my life. Um, at 834, Patrick, Momentous Escape Vacations, Melanie, love that name, by the way, mm -hmm. asked about pure OCD. And I know we're at the end of the end of the time, but Michael answered it, which is mm -hmm. most people understand that the concept of pure OCD feels like I'm constantly just up here. So the word preoccupation is not an obsession. It's an active thing someone's doing, which we would call a mental ritual or a rumination. And you're doing it up here over being preoccupied is an active effort to focus on the solution, the Rubik's cube, the missing puzzle piece. You're trying to figure out the who, what, where, when, why, how, what if, and that's not obsessions. That's not happening to you. You're actually doing it. It's a cognitive action. And if you choose that cognitive action, to Michael's point, you're stuck. That's what a preoccupation or rumination is. That's the ritual part of what people describe as pure OCD. It's not just obsessions. It's just all up here. But when you're preoccupied about anxiety, this is going to be weird to say, imagine if you could be preoccupied with friendship, mm -hmm. love, kindness. As Patrick, as you said, no one walks in and says, Doc, can you fix my happiness? But imagine if you spent time ruminating on, fixating on the beautiful people, places, and things in your life. And if you don't have those, then I hope you find a therapist, a friend, or a colleague to help you find those. But that's that moment in between being zapped and listening to it, or if you can choose anything else that adds to your life, to me, you've initially cracked the code of OCD and health anxiety. And that's across every intervention that all of this have been trained on is to know when you get duped, that you're being duped, and that you can choose to think about and focus on anything else. And if you do, for that singular moment, you've won the game. And if you do that enough times, you become Beth and other people. You've cracked the code and you start making yeah. your life bigger and more beautiful. And that's all any of us ever want for people who battle with anxiety. What a great way to end. I want to thank Josh and Michael for being here tonight. Let's uh, let's show that book one more time, just to, you know, just to let everyone know what we were working on again tonight. Health anxiety. Health anxiety, people. There we go. Written by Josh and Michael, Josh Patownik, Michael Steer. 
forward by yours truly, Patrick McGrath. Thank you very much. As always, good to see you fine, fine gents here. Thank you for joining us. This is always the fastest hour of the week. I can't believe how, how quickly it just flies by when we're having these amazingly fun discussions. And thank you all for joining us. We will be back next week. John Grayson will be here and uh, we'll be chatting again. So have a great time, everyone. And we will see you soon.